that we pray the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So, Resurrection Sunday, today, is, as I said earlier, the last day of the most important week of the year. And this last week, I was looking at some of the some some things online, and I came across this one pastor uh, who put out his he put out a little video each day for each day of the week, and he had a little catchy name for each each day of the week. All right, so it starts with Palm Sunday, which everybody recognizes, but then he has Disruption Monday, <laughs> the day that Jesus goes into the temple and he disrupts the th things at the temple. And then he had Entrapment Tuesday, uh, because that was the day, as we read the Gospels, that there were people coming to Jesus, and they were asking him questions, and a lot of those questions were designed to try to get him to say something that they could attack him for. So they were trying to trap him. And then there's Spy Wednesday, which uh, is a little bit more difficult to see, but that's the day that traditionally Judas went to the priest, or he got to dinner with the priest, and they decided to that, that Judas would be the one to betray uh, uh, Jesus. And then there's Monday Thursday, which for all of you came out last Thursday night for the foot washing, and that's the last supper that Jesus has with his disciples. And so that's uh, that's Monday Thursday, and then Good Friday, the day that Jesus died on the cross. Mm -hmm. And then there's Silent Saturday when <laughs> nothing happens. And you can imagine just being one of those disciples gathered together and trying to encourage each other and trying to figure out what's going on. And literally from the time Jesus dies on Friday until Sunday morning, there's just silence. You can just feel the quiet of, of the time. Nothing happens except something is happening to Jesus and to the disciples. And then Resurrection Sunday. Oh, much better than that. Amen. 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 So that's the, you know, today's the day. Everything, everything changes today. After all of that other stuff, after the disruption, after the spying and the, and the death on the cross and all of those things that we see, now everything, now we celebrate, but when you look at the Gospels, a lot of times you realize the disciples really were, we could have called this, you know, um, questioning Sunday or something, because a lot of the, at the right at that moment, you go to the empty tomb, and the, the, there's actually questions is what there is. What's going on with this? The guy died. We say, and you know what happens to dead people, right? You put them in the grave, and they stay there. <laughs> but now he's gone. Now what do we make of all of this? And it took him a while to get in all of those kinds of things. And so what happens over time is, over the, the, to the disciples is, they start realizing that this event that they don't understand is actually the most important part of the whole process. Now, the death of Christ is important because that's a sacrifice that pays for, this, for our sins and that it, show, it is a demonstration of God's love and God's grace. It is an important part of it. But without the resurrection, we have some issues. We need the resurrection. Jesus needs to rise from the dead. Otherwise, the death is uncertain. It, it's, it's kind of, it almost is like the death of the animals in the old temple sacrifice. Okay, they died, and that covers some sins from yesterday, but what about my sins tomorrow? What about what happens now? What happens next? That is Jesus going to have to come back again and die again, and you can die again? And so the thinking of the, uh, the uh, disciples have turned to the resurrection and realized that this was the important thing. So 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 12, there's a uh, just a little short paragraph here where we just dis discuss this resurrection. Paul's discussing it. And he says, But if it is preached that Christ has been 
has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now that's kind of weird, right? There's Christians saying there is no resurrection? You wouldn't think that would happen. But Paul says, of course, there are people who were saying, no, there's no resurrection. When you die, that's it. You just go in the grave and you stay there. And then Paul's basically going to say, okay, what about Jesus? He didn't stay there. So what does that mean? So, verse 13 says, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Notice he doesn't say, if Jesus didn't die, your faith would be useless. He says, if Jesus doesn't, isn't come out of that grave, if he isn't resurrected, if there is not new life, then you guys are all wasting your time here. You could have slept in this morning, you could have went out to brunch, you could have done almost anything, and it wouldn't have mattered. And Paul says, no, this is the thing about, even, even the main thing about Christianity is that there is new life, and that life comes after death. And so that is, that's why we rejoice on this day. And that's why the disciples here, years later, when they look back on it, they can say, yeah, the resurrection, that's the big deal. That's the big, that's the big deal about Christianity, is that there is new life after death. That's, that, that's the difference, really, about this religion and then all other religions is that we believe that something happens after death. Okay? okay? So you guys are all looking at me like, oh, this is really deep stuff. I never heard of this before. <laughs> well, hopefully that's not true. Hopefully you've been hearing this for a long time. But this is the, but this is the, I, uh, actually I got all excited and I stopped reading, didn't I? So verse 15, more than that, more than that your preaching is useless and your faith is useless. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. So not only is your faith worthless, but if you believe that if you if Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead, you are and you and me are liars. We lie every day. Every time we talk about this. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. He says it like three different ways so that you kind of get it, okay? If you preach there's no resurrection, Jesus didn't raise. If Jesus didn't raise, our faith is worthless. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. So the death of Christ is important. The cross is important. But we have to believe that there's new life. There's something after death. And that's where we are actually in the book of Romans. I have this quote from a man named S. Lewis Johnson, who I don't know who he is, but I found the quote, so I have to use it. And I attribute it to him because other people did. But here's the quote. The resurrection is God's amen to Christ's statement, it is finished. Christ says it is finished. And God says, Amen, and I'm proving that by raising Christ from the dead. We know it's true because the tomb is empty. That's how we know. So, that's the, uh, the, um, that's the, that's the important thing about today. But, we're going through the book of Romans, so I have to go to the book of Romans and talk about at least some of the verses there, right? Because it's the way I do it. You have to go back, I, I, I can't just skip over it. So, Romans... Chapter 5 is where we ended up last week, and we're going to emphasize, we're going to talk about this new life that we get, this resurrection. What does a resurrection mean to us? So in verse 20 of chapter 5 in Romans, it says, the law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. Not literally, but the idea being that the more we know God's word, the more, more than we know the law, the more we realize we sin, the more we realize that we fail to keep God's laws. And so that's what it means by trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So God can cover. You can say, well, I've broken every law in the Bible multiple times. And Paul said, yeah, but grace covers all that. And it doesn't matter how many times you've done it. It doesn't matter if you do it tomorrow. 
grace still covers. Because grace covers everything that we do. God's grace. The gift takes care of all of it. Thank you, Lord. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life to Jesus Christ our Lord. So, God's grace is shown in the death of Christ, and then it's validated by the resurrection. There's new life after death. There's, there's something, you just, that's the, that's the order. It's, it's, it's life, then death, and then life again. So you have that. So the resurrection then proves that life after death is possible. There's something after this. And so that gives us hope. That gives us encouragement. That helps us to see that God is still working in us. Even if we fail, God's grace keeps lifting us up. God's grace keeps responding in this way. The interesting thing, though, is, is that one of, the, one of the characteristics of Paul's writing is, is that he brings into uh, the conversation in his letters, he brings into it stuff that he's faced. By the time that Paul has written this letter in Romans, he's been preaching for 20 years. And so he's been preaching these things, and he's been talking, and, and he, you know what? After the sermon, and I, as a pastor, I know this happens. After the sermon, you, you know, you're shaking hands with people, and then they, you got people saying, okay, Paul, but what about this? And what about that? And he, it, it, there, here's, well, here's a problem with what you're preaching, Paul. And so Paul's gotten used to the idea that people have questioned what he's saying. And so you think back to the verse we just read. Sin, but grace is more. And if sin increases, grace increases. Okay, you hear that little thing? So this is what people said. In Romans chapter 6, verse 1, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? You see the logic there? Well, I know lots of people. No, there's no logic there. It's what but people do. Well, if God's grace is so great, and getting God's grace is so great, shouldn't I go sin so that God can forgive me and I can get more and more grace? Yeah. Some of you are saying, well, that sounds good. That sounds like a pretty good deal. Maybe we should go that direction. And then, But the next words are in verse 2, depending on your translation, the NRA says, by no means. Some say, God forbid. Why? Because that makes no sense. It makes no sense that I would use this new life I have in Christ to do the opposite of what God wants me to do. That doesn't, that there, there is no logic there. Now, to some people, there might be some logic there, but to the average person, you think, well, no. God has given me eternal life. When I put my faith in him, and God has given me this life, shouldn't I use that life to honor God as much as I can? Yeah. In fact, in fact, in another place, we're not going to go there. Look, there, some other time we will. But in, in another way, every time we sin, in some sense, we are killing Jesus again. Now that's real kind of metaphysical and kind of out there, but that's the, that's the picture that we have here. It is true that grace covers your sin. It is true that God forgives. But every time we do something that needs forgiving, then Christ's death has to be applied again. Now, God's willing to do that, but it shouldn't make us happy, and it doesn't make him happy. We should understand that we have this new life, and we're supposed to live it after we hear the gospel. So, verse, going on from verse 2, by no means... We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. There's life after death. That is... Is, is a reference to our lives here. So that when we, um, when we go, when we die in this body, we go to heaven. That's eternal life. But that's not what he's talking about here. 
Now, he mentioned eternal life back in the previous verse, and that's true. But the attitude is supposed to be, when I put my faith in Christ, I die to all of those things in the past. Those things no longer have any control over me. Those things no longer are part of my life. I'm supposed to now live a new life. And we symbolize that by, just as we did today with Bailey, we put her under the water. She dies, and she's buried under the water. And then we lift her out, and now she has a new life. She has this new life that she's supposed to be living. That new life that God is going to give her if she's willing to do it. Of course, if she goes like some of these people Paul's talking about, we could say, well, yeah, I know I died to all those things, and I, and I know that I have this new life. But you know, there was a lot of things about my own life that were pretty good. And I kind of liked it back there. So I'm just going to keep doing all those things. And even though, and even then, God's just going to, grace is just going to forgive me, and I'm going to grow, grow. And yeah, you guys got it. You know, we don't need to go down that road anymore. That's the, but that's the idea is, is that it's not just that when we die, that life after death, it's like when, it's, uh, when we die at the end of our lives, it's that we have died now. And we have a new life now. I notice at the end of that verse where it says, we too may live, he doesn't say we may live an eternal life. He says we may live a new life. And that starts right now. It starts when you put your faith in Christ. It starts when you choose to follow Jesus. When you're born again. There's lots of different ways that the Bible says those kinds of things. But the whole point is, all that stuff is now behind me. What's in front of me is a new life. A new way of living. A new way of thinking. Later on, he says, you've got to renew your mind. You've got to start thinking the new way, not the old way. You've got to start realizing that following Jesus is about change in your life. You're going to do things differently. So, baptism symbolizes our death with Christ and our new life with Christ. Now we live the way Christ did, or we're supposed to. We're supposed to believe that now that Christ has died and I have died with him, then now I can live the way that Christ did. And so we are, we're, we're just supposed to be different. It's one of the, I was going to be real critical about people, but in some ways it's the biggest problem that we have as church or as Christians is, is that we don't live the way that Jesus did. We still think a lot of ways the way we used to. And I'm not going to go down that road too far. But I'm just going to say this. Baptized us is our death with Christ, our new life with Christ. But that the life God gives us is to be the image of God to others. Mm -hmm. A lot of times when we talk about what, the, what it means to be created in the image of God, we think of it in terms of, well, what, how am I like God? But the image of God is also the uh, idea of other people looking at me. And do they see God? When they look at me. That's what an image is. Am I living the way that God wants me to? Now we we just we talked about the question earlier about how the law shows who, who we are and how we how we break God's law, we don't live that, and we need a savior. Okay, well, when we look at the law, we see that when people look at us, they're supposed to see God's grace, love, mercy forgiveness, all of those things. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, we don't. That's why we, it, you know, one of the things I was thinking about this week is we talked a couple weeks ago about how God credits righteousness to people. And I think that a lot of times we think of that in terms of up to the point where we're saved. That God, we, we put our faith in God, and then God credits us righteousness, and he saves us, and now we're kind of put over in this category, and now, now what? It, but we go back to old business, but the, the, the point is, is that God doesn't stop crediting righteousness. God has to keep giving us righteous until we get to heaven. And that's something that a lot of times I think Christians think, oh no, I'm a Christian now. He doesn't have to credit me righteousness because I am righteous now. Nope. Well, that, well, we'll stop, stop, stop. <laughs> Why would you say that? The Bible says... That, God, that faith is how we get credited righteousness from God. And that never stops in this life. 
God is always crediting righteousness to us because we can't keep the law and what the Bible says perfectly. And so God has to keep giving us righteousness of Christ because we need him to. And so that's the part, part of this. It's part of new life. In verse, um, in verse 5, it says, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. If we die with Christ, then we live with Christ. <coughs> For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. That's the law of sin and death, by the way. How do we know everybody sins? Because everybody dies. But once you die, you're set free from all that. So when you rise to new life, you don't have to worry about that sin. The problem is, we keep going back to that. See, the, st the statement here is, this is the way that God wants it to happen in our lives. There's the, the, the analogy is to... Um, Israel back in the wilderness, they, they get out of Egypt and they cross through the Red Sea symbolizing their baptism and then they get the law and then what do they do? Oh, it was so much better back in Egypt. There was so much, we had better food, we had better, they, everything was better back then. And they always wanted to keep going back, even to the point where they made idols and they did it, right? Well, the, it, this isn't any different with us. We always... And the, 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 we always kind of want to go back to some things because we think, oh, those things were pretty good, actually. Well, now that I think about it, it's this, by the way, this is old people disease. Did you know that? <laughs> well, no matter how old you are, things were better 20 years ago. <laughs> it doesn't matter what was going on back then. It was just better then. Food tasted better. People were nicer. Everything was better back then. Well... Probably not as much as, you, yeah, Nick says amen, but I don't know, that just popped into my head, by the way, I'll give that for free, I'm not going to charge you for that. So, the, our, when we talk about this new life, when we talk about, and this is something about witnessing a baptism, it, there's a lot of witnessing that goes on in our lives as we watch, uh, we look at people and see what they do. You guys all watched um, Bailey get baptized this morning. That means you were witnesses. And so this is where it gets really kind of, um, when we look at her now, this is, uh, she's not in here, right? So we can talk about her all we want. So the, uh, and this, I, I, I'm tempted to talk about the analogy to a wedding too, but um, there are just things, what's that? No, 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 that's right, I wasn't talking about that. I was talking about the witnessing part. You realize that when you go to a wedding, that you have a job to do when you're there? Because you're witnessing these two people make vows to each other. Mm -hmm. And technically speaking, if they break those vows, you, as witnesses, can go to them and say, no, I saw you, I heard you promise for better or for worse. I heard you promise those things. Why aren't you keeping your promises? Mm -hmm. That's what a witness does. And that's kind of what happens when we witness a baptism. If Bailey now lives a certain life, we can go to her and say, but we saw you baptized. We saw the new life in you. How come you're living the way you do? Why are you making the choices that you're making? You have a new life in Christ. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the comment here is that the new life of the believer is supposed to show that we are free from sin's hold on us. Mm -hmm. And I put the word supposed to in there, and I should have underlined it and circled it and put it in the <laughs> word. Because that's what it's supposed to do. But we all know people who claim new life in Christ. We all know people who say they're believers, but then they do things that are clearly not what God wants them to do. It goes back to the question. We clearly see them doing things that the Bible says don't do, and they do it anyway. Now, they may not go through a logical thing like chapter 6 earlier, but this is what it's supposed to be. We don't wait till we're in heaven to live the way that God wants us to. We do it now. And we're supposed to do it now. Which is why we read the Bible. Which is why we gather together to encourage each other. Which is why we pray for each other. Because we need all of that together to be the image of God so that this is what people see. If I claim to be with 
Christ, if I claim to have new life in Christ, but I'm not trying to be who God wants me to be, then no wonder people don't want to come to church. No wonder people don't want to hang out with Christians. Because you, I, I always say that if, if we're actually living the way that Christ wants us to, one of two things will happen. One is some people will just be so attracted to that that they, you can't keep them out of the doors. They'll come in and they'll want to be a part of it. Of course, the other side is, is that if you live the way Jesus did, there's also going to be a significant number of people who want to kill you and to put you on a cross. So both are true. But any church that actually lives out what God says we're supposed to, we won't be able to keep the people out of the doors. Because people will come. Because they will be attracted to it. Now, they may not stay, because once they realize that they have to be that way too, that might mean to. But, but the point is, is that people are attracted to Jesus. They didn't always stay, they didn't follow him all the way, but they were still attracted to him. They still wanted to hear what he had to say. They wanted to see what he had to do. And so that's what we want for people. We want to have to lock the doors at 1030 because the church is full. <laughs> if that's the problem, though, we'll build a big church. Because Tim's got all kinds of money. He's ready to spend it. So <laughs> He just went out the back door, by the way. <laughs> wow, I'm getting all wild up. Let's look at verse 8. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So Jesus died. Because of our sin, he was on the cross. But he died once. He's not going to come back and do it again. No need to do it again. There's no need to come back and, and go over it all, that, do all that stuff again. But now, he, it says, now Jesus lives to God. He died, now he lives. And his whole motive for living is to live for God. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, that's good that Jesus does that. <laughs> Isn't it good that Jesus is doing that for us? But then we read verse 11. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Amen. So Jesus did it. So we're supposed to do it. Isn't that a novel concept? I mean, how often do you hear that, right? We're supposed to be like Jesus. If Jesus is living to God now, we're supposed to live to God now. Even if people think we're weird or strange, or that they can't do it, or whatever it is they think. We're supposed to live to God now. And I think that as I'm going through this, that contrast between those two things, sometimes I, I really do think this, and I could be wrong. I've been wrong once or twice before. Well, I could be wrong, but I think that a lot of Christians think in terms of, I, I accepted Christ, and now I'm good until I die and I'll go to heaven. And what Paul's message is here is, no, when you died and rose with Christ, as we talked about in baptism, you have a whole new life to live. And it starts now. It doesn't start then. You have all kinds of stuff that, that you're supposed to be doing to live to God and for God and, and, love, and you know, love, your, love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, even love the people that are sitting next to you. Even them you have to love. And it's like, no, I would prefer just to go about my life, do the things I want to do, and then when I die, I'll go to heaven, and I've got my ticket punched, as they say, and that's all. No, the Bible is 99% about how to live in this life. After you die and go to heaven, whatever's going to happen then is going to happen. But now, you live a new life. So, the resurrection reminds us that we live eternally with God. I'm not, not saying that's not true. But we can live now the life God wants us to live. Amen. Because we have died to sin. And we cannot, we don't go back to that. And that's really, that sometimes it's hard for us. Because there's lots of things that we like about the old past. 
You, you guys got it. You guys got it figured out. I don't have. I, I wasted my whole morning talking to you guys because you guys already knew all this. And, <laughs> but I just felt like maybe I should remind you of think back to your baptism and think back to what happened in that baptism. Mm -hmm. Or even better, think about that time when you decided to follow Jesus. Mm -hmm. When you decided to accept the truth of the gospel. When you decided to put your faith in God and in the death of Jesus Christ and God credited righteousness to you and accepted you into his family. Praise God. Baptism doesn't do that, by the way. It just is a witness that that has happened mm -hmm. to you. And so the other people can see it. Now, in 1 John, or not 1 John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 9, it says, The true light that gives light to everyone is coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children who are not of a natural descent, nor a human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. Mm -hmm. God did an act in Bailey's life. Mm -hmm. He's done an act in many of our lives. Mm -hmm. That act isn't baptism. Baptism is something we do to show that this has happened. But God changes lives. And that's not, it says, the children born not of natural descent. In other words, it doesn't matter who your parents are, whether they were believers or not, it's not the issue. They can't choose for you. You have to choose for yourself. Uh, not, nor of human decision. And that this is where it gets kind of a, you know, God is the one who actually saves people. We put our faith in God, but God's the one who actually does it. Or a husband's will. Your spouse can't decide for you. I can't decide if my kids are going to be saved, or if my wife is going to be saved, or if my neighbor, I don't get to decide that. It's something that God does when we put our faith in him. It's all God that does all, that's why we praise God for all these things. This is the truth. The true light that gives light to everyone is coming into the world. Now with Jesus, his death, and his resurrection. Even his own didn't accept it, it says here. But anybody who does, all we have to do is put our faith in Jesus. Jesus saves us, and then he says, here, I'm giving you a new life to live. And then we have to, then we live that life. And he gives us everything we need to do that. I'm usually the problem, not God, by the way. I swear I like to put it. The problem is me, not God. So I'm going to give you that opportunity right now for you to uh, just think about the fact that that all it takes for you to do is to put your faith in God. You just turn to God and say, be merciful to me, a sinner. Forgive me, God. I have gone my own way. I have done my own thing. And now I want what you're offering. I want that forgiveness. I want that cleansing. I want that washing. I want... I want that new life from God, from you, God. And when you pray a prayer like that, God says he is ready to receive you. After all, if, if, if he sent his son to die for you, don't you think that he's ready and waiting for you to, to forgive you and to accept you into the family? I mean, is he going to, at the last minute, say, yeah, I know my son died for you, but eh, I, don't, I don't think you're going to make it. So, no, God doesn't do that. God is ready and waiting. So bow your heads for a moment, and if you have already done that, and you are a child of God, then you, this is your opportunity to <coughs> praise God and thank Him, and ask Him to help you live this new life that He has given you and offering you. If you've never done that before, then just ask God to forgive you, to thank Him for sending His Son. Confess that you are a sinner, you've broken God's law. And then just, and again, do the same thing. Just ask God to give you that new life and really give you an awareness that you have this new life. Mm -hmm. And you can leave all that stuff behind. And as you pray that prayer, 
God fills you with the Spirit. And you feel the relationship that you now have with God. Our Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for the testimony of uh, the baptism. I thank you for each person here. I thank you that they took out time from their week to come celebrate uh, Jesus' resurrection. Father, we pray that this would be something that would fill us with joy, fill us with praise, fill us with a sense of your presence, and that we would leave here with a renewed confidence, a renewed desire to follow you wherever it is you will lead us. And then, Father, we will come back next week and give you more praise and more honor and more praise and blessing to you. So, Father, thank you for each life here today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.